Welcome to Pod Places. I am Jeff Sigler with Revitalizer Dye here in Pittsburgh. And I'm Ryan Shore with Civic Brand in Dallas, Texas. And uh, Phil is, is taking some time off from the pod, but uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, Proud Places contributing partner John Paget with us today. Uh, John is with First and Main Films and is going to be talking about the uh, Better Cities Film Festival, which has been going on. So we're looking forward to getting into that. But first, I want to start with uh, how, how are you guys doing? Doing good. Enjoying the, we we're just talking about the fall weather. We're, we're enjoying that here as well. So. Yeah, you guys get some of that down in Texas? Barely, not like you guys. Um, we get, it gets a little bit, it gets not 100 degrees for a little bit, and then we go straight into winter, so. That sounds terrible. Yeah. Things in, in Buffalo pretty good? Oh, they're great, yeah. The fall, the fall is too short here as well. Um, and um, actually, it was just um, my, one of my first years after I moved to Buffalo from the Northwest, we had a huge winter storm, uh, snowstorm with a couple feet of snow hit October 13th. So that would be tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> if you can imagine that, like two feet of snow on October 13th. That's wild. That's I mean, the, wild. Tree, the trees hadn't even turned color yet. So um, it was bad because the snow piled up on all the leaves mm -hmm. and then the trees all started cracking and it killed a whole ton of trees in the city and it was called the October surprise. Uh, yeah, let's, I would like to stay away from all October surprises if possible. Um, yeah, October is incredible here. I mean, it just, I wish we could get three months out of this month, but um, so John, uh, you are just wrapping up the better cities film festival. Is that correct? That's right. We just wrapped up a uh, four day, all virtual online film festival. Uh, with about over over 80 films from 26 countries. Wow. Um, I'd like to get to this year, but I'd, I'd be pretty interested to know, like, how did this all get started? Well, it all got started actually as a joke, believe it or not. It all started as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> as, as most uh, great things. <laughs> um, it's kind of um, unbelievable. So my little brother, uh, my younger brother, Josh, is a com was a comedian in LA uh, and worked, he managed a comedy theater down in Hollywood. And um, about uh, nine or 10 years ago, our company, First and Main Films, started doing a lot of films about new urbanism. And we were going to the Congress for New Urbanism. We won a big film contest there. And then we were doing a series all over the country partly sponsored by them and Notre Dame Architecture School. So we're doing these films about new urbanism. And I would say like my number one fan was my brother. And he was such a fan of these films that he thought, you know, there might be other films, there might be other filmmakers doing stuff on this. And let's start a film festival devoted to these, this genre. So he started the New Urbanism Film Festival Partly just because it's funny. I mean, film festivals, we all know, have gotten more and more uh, specialized right. they, around topics and stuff. And so he thought, you know, I'm just going to go jump the shark right off the bat and we're going to go with the most niche film festival ever. It's the new Urbanism Film Festival. And he had a theater because he manages his comic theater. So he had a built in sort of thing for it. And really, the beautiful thing about it is that it, it brought these discussions about urbanism and urban design and urban planning into a non-threatening environment, right? So you're in a comedy theater, you're having drinks and you're watching new urbanism films and it's kind of not too serious. But what it, I think his mission was all along is we've got to get people, similar to Proud Places, we've got to get people, ordinary, just everyday people engaged in these conversations about urban design and things that affect our city. So that was kind of his goal with bringing these films into a comedy theater and inviting the public to interact over these topics. And how long ago was that? That was uh, 2013. Okay. So he, he ran that for about five years. And uh, what started happening was um, 
people were coming to it and, and finding out about it and then saying, you know, I would love to take these films and screen them in my community. So we built out a model where he, uh, he could take the best films of the festival into one reel and then other cities can host screenings in their community. So it became like a traveling distributed film festival. So other cities started doing, you know, one night events. Um, and he did that for about five years. And then um, he entered seminary. So he's currently, uh, he moved to Alexandria, Virginia, and he's, he's training to become an Episcopal priest. And about the time he was doing that, my colleague Chris and I at First in Main Films thought, well, the festival was kind of up, up undetermined what, what its future would be because he had to move from that theater. He no longer had a venue. He's going to seminary now. What are we, you know, what's he going to do? So we decided, you know, First in Maine, this, this really aligns with First in Maine films and everything we're about in terms of storytelling and how it can help cities. So we decided to take it over, keep my brother Joshua on as festival director. So he still runs it day to day because uh, he really knows how to do it. Um, but then we also rebranded it. So we renamed it because we felt like new urbanism was kind of holding it back. Um, and the films were broader than new urbanism. You know, they're about biking and art in the city and urban farming and all the, just a huge variety of topics that are generally just about making cities, towns, and neighborhoods better. So, I mean, we still have that new urbanist point of view about what makes a city better, you know, walkable, beautiful places like that. But, um, we changed the name to just more accurately, accurately reflect what it's about and help people understand it better. Cause we felt like maybe the name was kind of holding it back. New urbanism. It kind of, if you don't know it, it may sc sound scary or something. I don't know. Sure. I don't, yeah, yeah, I get that. I think that uh, new urbanism is a, is a certainly a term that uh, is, is hard to describe and I um, sort of puts people off a bit. And I don't know, I, I always come back to the idea that like old urbanism is <laughs> is pretty uh, on point as well. Um, right. So yeah, uh, but I get that. But better cities, I, I like. So when did you make the switch to better cities? Uh, just two years ago. So we had, we kind of had a one year hiatus and then, and then because we no longer had that kind of built-in venue in Hollywood, we asked ourselves, you know, where should we land? Where should we put on this festival? And um, we had a lot of contacts in Detroit and we felt like the Detroit brand, if you think about Detroit as a city, it was the perfect city to align with and make that our home. Because there's just, um, to me, Detroit is the poster child of urban revitalization uh, in the U.S. in terms of both all of the challenges that Detroit faces, but also all of the creative stuff happening there. I mean, there's a really a lot of cool things happening in Detroit. So we felt like that would be a great home for it. And it's, um, you know, the location, it's a hub airport and people can drive. There's a lot of population that can drive there. So when we go to hold a flagship four day event there, it seemed like a good spot. And then, um, COVID hit. So then we had to pivot hard and um, hold off on doing Detroit, maybe hopefully till next year. And then we went all virtual this year. Okay. So the plan is to, um, to host it in Detroit next year if everything gets back to normal. Right. And, and this time for like October-ish? Yeah, I think so. It, it, it seems like a good time for weather in, in Detroit and um, yeah, and, you know, in the festival itself, uh, when we've done them in the past, they've been so much more than, um, uh, just film, sitting in a theater and watching films. There's been urban walks and exploration and tours and tactical urbanism and creative placemaking. And so it becomes a four day event that's, you know, packed with all these other opportunities along with watching the films. And so we look forward to doing that. Um, it was cool being virtual because people could tune in from everywhere in the world. But really the heart of it is um, getting, gathering people together to experience story and ideas and inspiration that they see on screen 
and they're people of a community. And when they all when they all see a story and get inspired at the same time with the same idea in the same moment, that's where I think magic happens. Because when we're isolated, we can watch an inspiring movie. You think about it. We watch an inspiring movie sitting home alone, but there's just like, what do you do with it? Um, no one else, you can call a friend and all excited, but like they haven't been through that same emotional journey you just were on. So they're not on the same page. So there's something really cool when you get a community gathered in one place at one time, they both go on that emotional journey together and then boom, hey, let's let's bring that to our town. Yeah, I think there's there, there's such a powerful thing, that idea of that shared experience like you're talking about. And I've even seen that with things that are online. You know, I think there's something really powerful when people experience things at the same time, even if it is online, because then, you know, on Twitter or Facebook, they're talking about it at the same time. Um, you know, you see like Netflix series where everything's released all at once. And, you know, you might be on episode 10, but I'm on episode one. And I don't know, I, I do feel like there's cool things about that, but there's there's something about that shared experience when people are watching it at roughly the same time and can interact and comment and it creates that snowball effect. Mm -hmm. Agreed, and I think that that's where change takes place, where people, right, to, to go through something together and then talk about how do we apply this? What does this mean? How do we uh, put that in place, which you just miss out? It's right, like, yeah, to that point, you know, you you can see an amazing sunset, but it's it's nice to turn to somebody and say like, oh, that was that was pretty nice, huh? Yeah, for sure. Totally. John, I mean, what is I mean, what is it in your opinion about that format and filmmaking and storytelling that that just makes it so powerful? Because I mean, we, you know, in the work that we do when we do branding projects, we try to really tell that story through you know video and and show it. Um, and we found that that's really powerful. I mean, I'm curious, like what drew you to that originally and why do you think that format is just so powerful for that change? I think, I think it is why I was drawn to it is because I recognized early on the potential to make people feel something, you know, from probably my very first videos I ever made in my life were like slideshows made for my grandparents anniversary or something. And to be a kid and to put together a series of photos and then choose some music and then you play that for your family and then people are crying and you're like whoa you know i made them i touched them you know i made them feel something so um i think it has to do with you know there's so many elements to a film there's the music that is doing doing work emotionally there's the visuals there's the actual um intellectual content of maybe what somebody is saying um so there's just so many levels of um, things that are happening, but I think probably the most important one is time. It's the one uh, art form that is temporal. So with, um, with other forms of art that's not inherently temporal, you can look at a painting and walk away. But with a film, you're watching it and it, whether it's two minutes or five minutes or two hours, you, you've committed this you're in it for this length of time and that's what can take you on a story and take you through a journey, a story arc, um, because it just has that time factor. Oh. Yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by this intersection of, of urbanism and, and film. And I'd love that. Uh, uh, I love the idea. I mean, not having heard of it before. I think it's such a great idea because we, you know, you mentioned earlier that you're, you're trying to wake people up to this whole concept of place because it's, it's, I don't know. I mean, that's, this is what we always come back to. Like it's, it affects everything we do yet. It's, it's somehow um, completely um, behind the scenes. Like it's, it's something that not hardly anybody is aware of uh, their place yet. It's, it's everywhere all the time. Uh, and, and that's such a big challenge. I think that we all have. So have you started to, are you seeing that that, is happening? Are you finding that people are kind of becoming more aware of cities and urbanism and place through through the uh, Better Cities Film Festival? I think definitely. I mean, I don't think we're still growing it and we don't have big budgets or corporate sponsorship yet. I think that's where we want to get to, don't we all? But um, so, I mean, we're, I don't think that we're, I wouldn't say that we're influencing pop culture yet, but I mean, for the people that we are reaching, I think we are. And um, over years, I think we've gotten now over 800 submissions or close to a thousand. So we now have a library of, you know, a thousand different titles that we can screen. And um, 
this year alone, I think there was a few hundred submissions. So um, we do see more and more filmmakers, um, I think, submitting better and better content, better and better films every year. Um, and they're just, they're, the variety is amazing. You know, I think like one of the audience favorites this year was called, called Motherload, and it's just a film about um, women who use are biking their families around in cargo bikes and just that whole movement or, or tribe around that and their stories. So that's just one little example of um, what is a better cities film festival type film, you know? That's great to hear. I mean, certainly, yeah, it's promising to know that more and more films are coming in um, to know more and more. Cause like if, if uh, that's a good sign. I mean, I love hearing it. Um, so talk a bit about how this year's, uh, how you switched up and how it's all been going, how it happened. <laughs> well, um, we had to quickly uh, pivot. And at one time we were still trying to be in Detroit and do some like live stuff from Detroit, but, it's, and they really wanted us to go there, but uh, we just, it just was too, still too unsafe. So it became all virtual. And um, so, yeah, it was four days and the films were available to watch around the clock. Um, and I don't know. Um, I can't tell you much more. We're, <laughs> we're, like we have uh, ballots, the balloting is ongoing. So viewers have a week to like choose their audience favorite. And so in about a week, we'll come out with our awards. Cool. Um, to that point, you know, kind of how do we get more people aware of this? I mean, what do you, what do you see occurring uh, in the, um, what do you think it takes to get more people aware? I mean, I think the movies are a big part because that's a big part of pop culture, but what else do you see that needs to happen to help make, because I, I know that we are all well aware of how important it is that, that we surround ourselves with places that, you know, that are nice, that are quality, that, that provide, you know, with a healthy lifestyle. But you know, I'm kind of interested in your input as a filmmaker, like what else needs to happen to make more people aware? Well, you know, I think we've talked about this. I think we need, there needs to be a TV show in a, um, like an Anthony Bourdain, what Anthony Bourdain did for food. I think there needs to be um, a TV show. That's pop culture, you know. If we get a TV show where um, people are going around and interpreting place, but you know, in the way that, not in an intellectual way, but in the way that Bourdain did for food, making it relatable. And um, I've heard rumors of some shows, like we've always seen these extreme makeover shows that are all about the home and the house. You know, what about the neighborhood? And we've pitched ideas for shows dealing with neighborhood transformation, but it's, it's so tough because with a house, you can shoot something self-contained and actually bring in crews and like see it transform within a month or a week and kind of capture that on film. But, you know, neighborhood transformation takes decades in some cases, it's, especially if you're doing something that's built to last, you know? So I, it, it's just not for that type of show. Everyone's had that idea. And I think there's still some ideas circulating like that, um, that might have potential, but I think that that's challenging, but I do think that's what, it, that's one of the things that could really help. What are your thoughts on just encouraging and inspiring just that amateur user generated content. I mean, with iPhones, people can shoot decent stuff these days. I mean, just, I don't know, how do, we, how do we encourage more people to go out and just view their place as their subject, you know, and just take photos and videos about your place and share it, what's working, what's not. Um, have you seen more of that now that that's been more accessible with people being able to shoot things on their phone and edit it real quickly? Um, not. Not so much. I mean, um, I don't think so much in film festival submissions, but aren't we seeing that with Instagram? I mean, right. people are photographing more. Um, I, the, I think the downside of Instagram is that it's all about beauty. And um, with, if it's all about beauty, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of losers <laughs> and so a few winners like exotic, the exotic places, you know, and um, what I, what I wish is that there was more of an audience for 
story because that's where I think everyone can compete. And a lot of the small towns that we root for and work for and champion have great story um, that doesn't translate just to a single Instagram image. But I think, I think people are waking up to the superficiality of the Instagram image too. I mean, cause everyone's chasing around uh, t- to photograph the same right. images and it's just, it's getting so tired and played out, I think. You know, I, it's funny and you brought up Bourdain and I found that most people that I run into that, that love place like are, are passionate about um, the concept of, of shaping place also seem to have a, a love for him. Uh, the, the Venn diagram is, is uh, basically a one circle there. And, and I wonder, you know, it, the comment on, on Instagram makes me think of that. Like what I really love about that show so much was that it was never about tourism. Like I hate, t- tourism is an Instagram photo. It's like, oh, look at, you know, let's look at this five-star hotel and let's look at this, you know, what's the most expensive meal and let's go look at this pool. And it's like, that's the most boring thing about a place are these phony, fake, you know, tourism type places. And, and he always went for the story to talk about the history, to talk about the people, the culture, which was was far more interesting. It was never about the beauty. It was about the stories behind it, which made that show like the, the greatest show. Uh, and I really missed that. But I, I think it was um, really gets to that point. Like you just, you got a, a more of a, an idea of what a culture was like by watching that show that you never would get in a tourism show. Yeah. yeah, I think we have to find though a way because, and I'm definitely not talking about people filming something on their phone for a film festival, but you know, I, I think that there, we have to find a way to use the platforms and the tools that are out there to encourage people to tell those stories. Because I think you're right about Instagram. It's very easy for it to just be very shallow and focused on the image. But I've also seen it's much smaller su- sub segment of the audience, but I have seen people doing some pretty cool storytelling with the, you know, Instagram TV and the video and, 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 you know, how can we push those platforms to, to, to be, you know, actual platforms for, for telling the story side of things. And, um, cause I've also seen there's, there's the beautiful photos and then there's, you know, the photography and, and art style that's very attracted to like ruin cities and the kind of like, you know, you know, you've heard like the term ruin porn of like, you know, they wanted to right. show like, it's kind of cool aesthetic to show vacant buildings and run down stuff. And, you know, that's always bothered me because I, I get the aesthetic of what you're showing, but I also, you're, you're kind of missing the point of the story. I feel like when you're, when you're just glorifying that as like, this is a cool symmetrical photo of a ruined building it's like well what's the story of that building and why is it like that and let's make it better let's not celebrate through photography that it's you know run down yeah that's that's why it's called ruined porn (laughs) (laughs) that really nails it i think right right ruin art or you know it's it's kind of garbage yeah it's it's fast i mean they're simultaneously like they're fascinating to look at and they're so sad and it's awful and it's uh it's a terrible story um and and right and it's almost it almost feels somewhat uh dirty as well to to like to take a p i don't know to sort of use um what is such a sad story as a way uh to highlight it to hold it up as you know like I don't know. It's, it's a sad story. Um, jumping back to the uh, film festival for a bit, John. So what do you kind of see as the, the future of it? Where do you think things are, are going and, and um, you know, both virtually with this year and then uh, kind of just in terms of growth down the road? I think in terms of virtually, we want to um, do like a screening every month, like pick a movie and then um, put together a really great panel to do post-film discussion. So um, we could talk about doing, you know, uh, some something in conjunction with Proud Places to, to pick a movie and do something like that. Um, but yeah, do, doing a once a month screening online, I think will be great. W- you know, what we discovered is that, wow, you know, four days to binge watch all these, all these films is just um, that in a way it's cool, but it's a challenge too. So we think that just doing a once a month screening and really promoting a particular film on a great panel would be great. But really what we're hoping is to get back, you know, I know um, 
whenever we're allowed to <laughs> return to gathering. Um, the real vision for this is those local community screenings. So for a very small fee, we've got a system streamlined to where a, a community group, a civic group can um, take the best of the fest or curate a screening. Like if, if a city or town is like looking at a big master project to do bike infrastructure and bike lanes in their city, we can curate a whole reel of short bike films or if they're looking to do housing or if they're facing issues of equity, um, you know, any topic, we have now have this massive library of nearly a thousand films and we can curate a reel of the best films on those topics. Um, so that's what, that's where we think the film festival can do the most good is when community groups can meet again and then we can put these reels together and local places can do their own screening of the Better Cities Film Festival. Yeah, I love that. We do, we do a lot of work on things like comprehensive plans and parks master plans and, and some of those projects we've organized little virtual chats where you know we'll show a, a TED talk on a certain topic that's related to what mm -hmm. that city's dealing with. And then we can kind of, the consultants can kind of do a Q&A afterwards. Um, but I love the idea of instead of it just being a talk, like let's sh sh show some films and like um, really get people inspired and then, you know, have the talk. And it's an easy way to to bring in a lot of quality content around a topic that, you know, otherwise you'd be flying in somebody to speak and, and do all these things. Instead, you can have this curated, you know, set of short films, play them, talk about them. And then um, so I think, yeah, tying into that planning community, getting cities to bring those in on those projects is a great idea. And I'm hoping we'll get traction like within Main Street communities um, because so many Main Street communities have an independent theater that has the ability to put on an event like this. Um, and it's just perfect. I mean, um, you know, gather, gather people together, not just to be entertained, but to for unique entertainment that's also for a purpose. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm, we're optimistic that someday when we can come back to theaters, um, we'll be able to really ramp it up and do those local events again. I love it. I, first, yeah, I think that uh, um, Proud Place is working to uh, working with Better Cities and, and First in Maine to uh, do a, a monthly screening is a great idea and have some panel discussions. I think that would be very fun to experience it with with other people and, and just have some good conversations following because, uh, yeah, I just I think that's a great fit. Um, and then, yeah, doing the that makes to a ton of sense about uh, being able to have them in the communities because right the, the thing about places it's just a it's a hard thing to understand how much it changed like video gives us the best chance of being able to understand how decisions like um, brick streets or, or, or public transportation you know the, the the pieces that make up place are really hard to I think that's what's a tough thing maybe about this field is it's hard to get somebody to understand and appreciate how much place affects them until they go somewhere else until you've experienced a place that does make you proud or you know provide dignity and I think that film has such a great opportunity to, to help do that so and I'm, I'm thinking of a couple uh, local theaters here in my neighborhood in South Hills of Pittsburgh where I would really very much like to host something like that I think that this is a city that would um, be into that uh, Pittsburgh thinks a lot about um, you know place and how we can do better in design so I'd, I'd love to uh, put something like that on here Exactly right. I mean, it's cross pollination, right? And seeing what other, seeing the ideas that have worked in other places, right? Hmm. You know, and then they're not just an idea, but wow, it worked there. It can work here. You know. So there's people that would want a, a main street community or an organization that would want to do that. I mean, where should they go to the Better Cities Film Festival site or First in Maine? Like, what what would kind of be their step to to bring something like that to their town? Yeah, if you go to Better. Uh, bettercitiesfilmfestival.com. We have a whole, we have, you know, button there right on the menu that's about hosting, how to host. And then if you have a film, there's also the submit button for submitting film. So. Uh, can you, have you gotten through all the films this year? No way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Josh, Josh, my brother is the festival director. He has, he has watched okay and he's watched every single one of them every single year so i kid him that he's, he's you know he probably he has this encyclopedic you know, he's the foremost expert on 
films about better cities, you know? I mean, he can, hey, Josh, is there a film about, you know, um, I don't know, just pick the most obscure topic and he'll he'll know them all. Oh, yeah, we have an animated short from 2017. That was, wow. so. so uh, I know you guys are doing, uh, like, the voting is going on in the awards. I guess, are you able to talk about any films that you, from this year that you really liked or that stood out while that's going on or? Yeah, um, you know, one amazing one was Segregated by Design hmm. um, based on Richard Roth, Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, about um, how American government, you know, really did through laws and policies segregate America. Hmm. And um, I have not read the book, but Jack's story and I interviewed the filmmaker and Jack had read the book, I think, yeah. And um, the film is just amazing. I think it's like 17 minutes long. Now, most really complex animations like this are like two or three minutes because they're just, you can't believe the amount of work that goes into them. And this one is just beautifully done um, by a guy in um, Austin, Texas, Mark Lopez. And um, yeah, it condenses kind of the idea, all the ideas in the book into this 17 minute film. And in some ways, just because of his visuals and the music, it, it I think packs an emotional punch that, um, I mean, I'm sure the book is incredibly devastating too in its critique, but the film really is spectacular. Um, I would love to, right, right. Like that's such a deep, dense, important topic, but it is, it's hard to convey in less than 700 word, or, you know, pages, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, because of how much goes into it, like right, that would be fascinating to see how somebody could convey it in seventeen. But but I, I mean, but you can you can convey so much more that way. And and again, it's such a better way to I don't want to say a better way. It's such you can show somebody explain something uh, so much faster and and um, get so much more. I guess into a small space using that. Like that is such a fascinating topic to have somebody approach that way. And I would love to see it. And how, how the film came about is, you know, he was impressed by the book or he heard the guy on NPR and wrote him an email and said, hey, hey, I have this idea. I think this would make an interesting project to do an animated film. Are you interested? He thought the author would never write him back, but he wrote him back right away and said, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so then he starts looking for grants and can't can never find any grant money to do it. And so meanwhile, he just decides like, I can either spend all my time doing the grant, finding grant money, or I can just do the film. He, it took him 15 months of work to do this film and he just cranked it out and it, it's just amazing. And I think it's gonna, will be a huge contribution. I mean, it can be used in classrooms and um, taught to kids now in a way that, you know, that book couldn't really work in, in the same context. So I think that's great. Another cool film was about the Space Needle. <laughs> you know, and I grew up, in the shadow of the space needle in Olympia and due to the name and the fact that it came about in the sixties, you know, I think everyone would assume that the inspiration for the design was just this whole, you know, Sputnik era, atomic age, you know, you saw a lot of that in, in that era in architecture, but this filmmaker digs deep into the history of how it was designed, finds out that the designer, um, drew inspiration from a sculpture he had on his desk that was by a Seattle sculptor called Three Dancers. And it was um, the shape of like three dancers back to back with arms raised. And, and then researches further to say, well, who, who was the inspiration for that sculpture? Who was dancing in Seattle at that time and was around and discovers the story of uh, Sevilla Fort, who was an African-American dancer that came out of Seattle and then went big to New York City and taught a lot of the famous actors and stuff. So she, she was a trailblazing kind of figure in as an African-American in modern dance. And so she makes this case, it's a little bit of a leap, but it's, a, it's an imaginative kind of believable case that the space needle was really inspired by her. And now, to me, when you look at the Seattle skyline, that's a great civic story because now you look at the Seattle skyline and you see something totally different. Yes. You yes. see something to be, you see th something that a Seattleite can be proud of. You see something that can, that is hopeful. 
you know, um, a symbol of somebody who um, overcame. And um, it's just a beautiful thing when somebody can use film to enrich how we see our city and how we see our skyline that way and un un uncover these stories that are basically buried. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. That's, awesome. that's ultimately Sorry. what it's all about, right? Is just reframing how you look at your cities, like reframing how you look at your place. If you look at the same building, but now you have a sense of pride about it because there's a story or meaning. And I, you know, we got to inter interview this guy and he was telling us all these historical stories of Dallas. And, and we were kind of talking about like, how many of these were actually true? And it almost kind of like to the space, you know, like it almost doesn't matter. Like in some cases, like if it's, if it's like a tall tale or if it's history, in fact, if it inspires you and makes you love your place more, it has value and it's worth sharing the story, I think. Right, and I also think like, you know, to be successful in this area, what we need is more people to understand. And so like take the, the, the book you mentioned, like, well, if, if you know, only one in every 100,000 people ever picks it up, yeah, that's 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 a disservice. I mean, that's unfortunate. But if a 17 minute film, uh, that's that's going to be so many more eyeballs on a subject that is so incredibly important. Yeah. Well, yeah, story just like you were saying, Ryan, it builds attachment. When you start to know the stories about your hometown and those details, um, I do think it creates a greater sense of belonging, a greater attachment, a greater affinity for your place. Sure. And that's something we've lost a lot of. I mean, I always, you know, one of the things when I think about building civic pride is identity is such a big part of that. You know, it, it's like we all have, you know, we all want to understand our, our DNA because it's somehow like, oh, I, you know, to know where my grandparents came from kind of gives me a little bit more pride because I understand who I am more. What work did they do? What, what part of the world did they come from? Where do they live? Um, and I think that that's very true with place like so many, you know, a, a subdivision in the cornfield is has, has no identity there's nothing interesting there's no history there's no story and that's ultimately like you're missing out on something that's that other places would have because the you know I, I guess i've come to this conclusion and making a few big moves in my life that you somehow your self-identity gets wrapped up in the place you call home and so if your hometown has cool stories if it has its own sense of humor if it has its own uh history like that that becomes a part of you and, and um in a way makes you feel more interesting or better and i, I love that about uh really exploring place and, and that, that like you said the stories yeah and i think that's where you know why you have people that really do focus on whether it's you know pre historic preservation or they're real focused on gentrification and some of those things because i think the thing we all have in common is we all want our places to be better right but we want to make sure that we don't just improve buildings and erase stories you know because if, if they're all nicer and newer and it's yeah this is better and nicer and it's i'm glad it's not vacant but if it loses its story then you, you erase something that you can't get back and I, I do think that that's an important part of you know when you talk about that's why i love the name better cities film festival because how, how is it better? Is it better because we, we fixed up all the buildings and it looks better? Or is it better because it's, yeah, we fixed up some buildings, but we also just have a greater appreciation for others. And we have a greater appreciation for the stories and the people that were there. Um, it, it's all of that. It's, you can't be a one way or the other. Right. And, and I think to that point, you know, it's really what goes on between the buildings that is where a city happens, is where a city gets better. Like the you know, they, whether it's Main Street or the ancient marketplace, you know, it's, it's the street in between those buildings. It's where the stalls are. It's where the people bump into each other. That's where better cities happen. And I think that that is, you know, there's too much of a focus on buildings. And I love that most of these stories, you know, they're, they're not, it's not about the architect. It's about, you know, what's taking place in between and the small things. And then, yeah, like the one about the, the moms and the cargo bikes, like that's such a fantastic and, and cool story because it's such a small part of city but on the other hand like that's where it all goes down that's where it all happens and that's important to to certain people um very very cool these are yeah i speaking of that i'm really excited to jump into some, i mean i want to see some of these but what are our options going to be i mean i know i, I just missed my four-day window which is that's that's uh, on me but you know, do you have um thoughts about uh ways that that you know people can watch some of these uh, um, outside of, of maybe this upcoming screenings or what are you thinking? 
Um, not really. I mean, for for our festival, um, you know, we have the the four day flagship thing virtually, and then the local screenings, okay. and then like I said, we might do it once a month. Um, some of the films are out there and available on other platforms. You can, you know, hunt them down. But um, if you go to our site, um, you can, without, um, even though you, it's over, the streaming is over, I think you can still go on and see like the full list of films and all the categories. And Well, I definitely, uh, yeah, I am sad I did not take part. I definitely would like, I'm up for the monthly screenings and then uh, next year in Detroit, I'm all on board. But let's, let's have, have one here in Pittsburgh sometime. Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. For sure. So John, is there any uh any any films you're working on that you can you can kind of share with us of what you're what you've got going? Um we are the the thing I'm trying to get going is to expand on this um small town spirit series of which the first one I did was about Tanino and their wooden currency. And what I want to do is just expand that out into an episodic series going to other small towns and finding sort of the towns that are punching above their weight in terms of innovation and ideas that they're implementing that then will inspire other small towns to say, well, a town of 2000 people did that. We can do that. Um, so I'm, um, you know, uh, proud places has been gr a great resource for me to, say, hey guys, what, what stories are out there? And so I'm getting some good um, input and ideas of things, stories to follow up on and places to go. Awesome, yeah, I love that it's 901. And super excited to see what you do next. So good, yeah, I, and I think that is such important work because you know I can't tell you how often I'll, I'll run into somebody that tells me a crazy story like, um, you know, uh, there's a woman in North Mississippi who she, you know, put her, uh, a second mortgage in our house so she could open up um, a bakery or a restaurant downtown and he, you know everybody told her you're crazy it's stupid don't do that why you're out of your mind and she said that um they'd grossed a million dollars within the second year like that they were crushing it uh and you know other people that have said yeah like uh, i took all my my whole retirement out and fixed up a building and how successful it's been i just think those stories are so critical to tell because that that most everybody in another town, you know, is thinking some of these things. There's somebody in every town that wants to do that and they're being told, don't, you're stupid, what a waste, you're crazy. And I think that those stories are so important to share so people can see like, no, I, I'm not crazy or maybe I'm crazy in the right way, but it works, it's happening because man, every, every town needs a champion like that. Everybody, every town needs somebody to take that risk. And so I think that's awesome work. You know, what we've done a lot in the past is the kind of traditional place branding, destination marketing, um, talent attraction, those kind of films for Buffalo and other cities. Um, and here I'm talking about first and main films, my creative studio. But what I really want to be doing and I, what I want cities to hire us to do is to tell the civic story because I think that's ultimately more powerful than what they're spending their money on and what they're doing. They're trying to attract these outside audiences and instead they could be making films that inspire their own local audience they already have and unlocking investment and unleashing love in their own hometowns by telling stories. And we've seen it happen because we've done it here in Buffalo. And we got criticized actually because some of the films we made for the tourism agency, Visit Buffalo Niagara, you know, were going viral and it was obviously like Buffalonians just loving, like spreading the love and sharing it and watching it. And, you know, get, we get a million views, but the impression is, well, it's all just Buffalo people watching it. I thought you were trying to attract outsiders, but but then something happened. We had a renaissance here. People started staying, people started opening businesses and taking risks and stuff. So we see if you can tell a civic story that reaches your local audience first, they be, then you turn them into ambassadors, right? right. Um, the, it's this criticism that, oh, you're preaching to the choir. No, maybe preaching the choir is the smartest thing you can do because then they start the singing, then they start singing loud and proud, right? And they become your greatest ambassadors. Um, and you can't buy that kind of promotion. You can't buy it. Um, so if you can, if we can make civic story films that create that kind of attachment and belonging 
and love for your hometown with the people you already have, you're going to turn all those people into the ambassadors. You're not going to need to do all that other outside target audience trying to reach outsiders because the people will start doing it organically and they're going to be more effective at doing it anyway. hundred percent, hundred for like, amen. And, and like, this is what is so important. Like tourism can't die fast enough. And, and like, you know, and, and so much traditional economic development, this idea that like, yeah, you're, you're Buffalonians money is no good. You know, we don't care about you. We need somebody from outside. We need people from Minneapolis to come here and spend their money. And it's like, it's like throwing somebody out of your restaurant to bring in somebody that doesn't have a table. Like, wait, why don't we serve the people that are already here? Those are going to be our best customers. So I'd love this. And it's exactly right. Like, you know, having a great tourism campaign isn't going to make people in your community love it more, but having people in your community love it more is going to have all these other benefits. Plus tourists are going to like that. Like, I think that we're, we're beyond the, you can't fake it anymore. And tourism and those types of promotional materials are, are just very fake and they're easy to see through. We had a county outside of Pittsburgh put one out and it's, you know, it was all the cheesy, like we're, t- we built America, we're tough, we're strong. And it's like, it's so phony. It's all a bunch of bullshit. You can see right through it. Which, and it left out any like sincerity or, or good story or, it just, it left you, you knew it was phony and it, it didn't, it didn't draw you there and it couldn't have won people over because it just was, it didn't ring true. So I love, love those ideas. I think it's just yeah. critical. Yeah. I mean, it has to be authentic for sure. Like that's, that's a no brainer. I mean, it's got to be authentic, but I think even when your goal is tourism and economic development, that's how you do that the right way is by telling those stories and, and making people want to come invest and open a business in your town by telling the stories of those that are doing that. And my article that I think for Proud Places this month that comes out in a couple days or so is that's exactly what we did is we were, we were brought in to do a branding project for Two Rivers, Wisconsin. But the way we approach that is we're going to tell the stories of the people that are here. And my article for Proud Places is about Emily, who is this, at the time, she was a 17 year old graduating senior in high school and she wanted to open an ice cream shop in this town. And this was a town that was a factory town and it was, it was kind of dying, the factory had left. And all her friends are like, why would you, why do you even wanna stay here? And why would you open a, a shop in a dying town? And we did all the traditional you know, public engagement and meetings and Emily at this time had been open for a year, was always the, the smartest in the room, you know, she ran circles around all the adults that were like, you know, talking about what the city needs. And, and she knew it because she just loved this place. And she knew, no, if, I know that if I build an ice cream shop, people will be lining up down the block. We'll come to this. And she did it and she pulled it off. And that building has, it's like a snowball effect. It's like slowly transforming, you know, downtown and the city and people visit from all over the state. Um, and it's such a cool story because she's this now 19 year old female entrepreneur who despite everybody telling her, why, don't do that, you know, leave, go to college somewhere else and start some other thing. She did it in her hometown because she had an idea and had that blissful, like, you know, you know, just blind optimism. And that's what we need. We need, we need to inspire people. So we focused a lot of our video and branding efforts on telling her story. Cause that is, in our opinion, that is the story of the town. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I love that. Take, you know, that could, I still think that fits though with you're in, I think a city can say we want to attract talent. And we want to attract investment and and those are noble things i think then it's our duty to say well this is the best way to do that right. tell the story mm-hmm. of these people here right more cities need to realize that and invest in that and, and they're way behind the times on it hmm. for sure excellent well awesome john yes you can't uh, really appreciate you coming on today to chat with us about the better cities film festival and look forward to hearing more news uh, I think the screenings will be great. Um, we can we can probably get a lot of eyeballs out for that, and I just I look forward to those. Um, as always, uh, be sure to follow us online. So we um, pretty active on Facebook. We've got a couple new articles come out each week from our contributors. Uh, share other articles. Um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I think that's about it. Uh, articles go up on our website, so check out proudplaces.com. Um, and that is a new website. Is that is that official, Ryan? Did we are we? Yeah, we made, new site? We update. Yeah, updated version that's going to keep evolving. But um, hopefully, this one can help people. You know, there's there's now a pretty good depth of articles and content there, so we want people to kind of be able to 
dive a little deeper and see some of the content that maybe they've missed over the last couple of months. So. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so yeah, Proud Places aims to help, you know, educate and inspire people to, to be, uh, to shape their place that they can be proud of. And so if you all are, are place evangelists, uh, definitely come and, and check it out. So thanks, Ryan. And thanks, John. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, yeah. Ryan. Yeah. Good chat with you.